This is a CBC Podcast. I'm Rob Norman. I'm Andrew Norton. And the Personal Best Podcast is back for Season 2. All right. Well, this is exciting. I wasn't ready to do this, but I'm going to give it my all. Whoa! Holy frick! Personal Best Season 2, a self-improvement show for people who don't like self-improvement. Subscribe now wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Danse, Anin, Boujou, hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Indigenous people across Turtle Island are working to return thousands of sacred objects and ancestral remains to their home communities. Indigenous belongings that were taken and put in museums, galleries, private collections and universities. Repatriation initiatives are on the rise here in Canada and around the world. To repatriate something is to return it to its place of origin, to give it back to the nation and to the people that it came from. Repatriation is outlined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and is considered an important part of reconciliation. But how does a community begin the process of repatriation? And what happens once the belongings come home? That's what we're exploring on the show today. That's the sound of a monumental totem pole outside the Royal BC Museum in Victoria coming down. It's one of two totem poles that had undergone recent structural assessments and were found to be at risk of falling over. Just a few weeks ago, the first one came down and will be sent to the community that inspired its creation. The Royal BC Museum is doing more than repatriating these two totem poles. They have a dedicated repatriation department, and they're working to repatriate the thousands of Indigenous belongings and ancestral remains in the museum's collection. I'm trying to remember the shortcut to get there. So this this is the collections building, the Fannin building, and we're going to go into the main exhibit space. My name is Luann Neal. I am from the Kwakwa people of northern Vancouver Island and my role here at the Royal BC Museum is repatriation specialist. As a repatriation specialist, Luann helps indigenous communities around British Columbia reclaim their belongings. To me, repatriation is the return of precious belongings to their home communities. I think uh, we need to go back around. And we're just going to go up these little stairs here. So in here, you can hear in the background, these are audio that were recorded back in the 1970s with our elders. So we have a display area that contains masks, It lights up and speaks to each of these masks. And when it lights up somewhere down here, we'll see that there's a mask that's been taken out and a picture in its place. So we're just able to shine a little light on an eagle headdress. That's just a flat photo now, but the mask was returned to the Nuchanov. The scope of what is in the collections are in the thousands. That could be anything from a simple headdress or a mask or a cedar bark cape or woven works, basketry, but also there's still 700 ancestral remains here in the museum. There are also thousands of audio recordings and photos stored in the museum that are part of the repatriation efforts. So the collections came to be part of the museum over many, many decades and in lots of different ways. When we talk about the ancestral remains, a lot of those came about because of construction, development. Anytime there was a development happening, if artifacts or any bones were unearthed, then it was the job of the anthropologist to go in, connect with the First Nation, and determine whether the area was an area that should either be designated an archaeological site 
or if things could be removed, and then the museum would serve as a repository. The Royal BC Museum doesn't have many pieces that were confiscated during the potlatch ban, but other museums around the world do. The potlatch ban, also known as the potlatch law, was part of the Indian Act. The ban lasted for decades, from 1884 to 1951. The ban made it illegal for Indigenous nations to practice the potlatch, which was the foundation of social, political, legal, spiritual, and economic systems. The impacts of the ban continue to reverberate. There are examples around the world of pieces that were confiscated during the potlatch ban, things that were given up under duress, under great duress by the communities, because they would otherwise be、uh, imprisoned if they kept their cultural belongings. So they gave them up, sometimes to Indian agents, sometimes to other representatives of government, and other times to private collectors, adventurers, and pioneers who just went out there and started taking things. Returning these belongings to their home communities is a process. The process, which is developing as we go for repatriation, usually involves the nation. Usually, contacts us first to ask, "Do you have anything that belongs to our nation?" And so, what we've been doing is making sure we're organized and have a sortable database. We're still very much in the thick of that. So, the community identifies any cultural belongings that might come from their area. And they let us know that they're interested in repatriating them. What we do from there is we have to go through a process of clarifying with the community who actually has the authority on behalf of the community. And it's not something that the museum dictates to the community. It's us just saying, "You let us know who your authority is. Is it your cultural center? Is it your First Nations Band Administration Office? Is it Chief and Council?" So once we know who the authority is, we usually get them to come and visit, and we take whatever items they're wanting to see, and have them ready for them to view when they come. And usually, we recommend that they come and spend a few days because it's very emotional work to do, especially if you're seeing something of your grandparents, you know, that you have either have never had a chance to see or haven't seen since you were a kid. So we get them to spend a couple of days with us figuring that out, and then we go through the process of clarifying and making sure that this belongs to that particular community. The museum. Can only repatriate to an entity. It can't repatriate to an individual. So that's a part of why we ask people to really let us know how they want to do that from the community side, and we take their guidance on that. And then the process after that is fairly swift. If everything's nice and clear, we know where things are going back to. Then we have an in-house team that can prepare the piece, pack it properly and safely. We have to make all kinds of arrangements for its transport. And then, oftentimes, the community will want to hold a welcome home celebration for whatever the treasures or the ancestral remains. Repatriation can also be costly, so the Royal BC Museum created a grant program with funding from the province. This past year, grants were given out to 21 communities to help them bring their belongings home. And once items are returned to communities, there is no one model of what it will look like. It actually looks different for every community once things are returned. Some communities have been working on this or thinking about this for a number of years, so they'd already created either display cases within their existing offices. Some of them have cultural buildings where they created special spaces for them. Other communities don't have a space yet to, to store them, and they may leave them with us for a time. And until such time as they have a place to house them, other communities have partnerships with local museums or post-secondary institutions that also have galleries. People have gotten very creative. There's no requirement by anybody that thou shalt have a museum to house these in. It's very important that the decision comes from the community. It's it's not the museum's place to. Direct the community on on what they should do or where they should put things when they return. Luann is also an artist, and for her, it's important to learn from the indigenous artworks stored in museums. The significance of accessing these older works was brought home for her when she visited the Burke Museum in Seattle a couple of years ago. 
So I went to the Burke and I selected a bunch of objects I wanted to study. And I was actually there to study two things. Number one was button blankets because I wanted to see what other button blanket makers did and carvings. So I picked a bunch of quagil carvings and one of the carvings was a rattle. And the curator put on this table all of the carvings I had selected and this rattle just seemed to keep calling to me. And I had it off to the side and it, it was going to be the last piece that I looked at because I was interested in the way it was carved. And it just kept calling and calling to me. And so finally I put down the other pieces that I was looking at and I, I looked over at the rattle and I said, fine, I'll pick you up then. So I went over and I picked it up and I shook it a little bit and I really liked the sound. And then I kept looking around and studying all aspects and all angles of it. And then at one point I thought, you know, if I was going to carve a rattle, I think I'd carve it exactly like this. So I asked the curator, can you get the, the information card and tell me who made this rattle? And so he went in the back and came back and he said, uh, yeah, that was made by John Neal. Well, John Neal was my dad, and I actually never met my dad. He passed away before I, I got to know who he was. And and both of us just stood there, you know, with those wide as saucer eyes going, do 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 this is spooky, but in the most amazing kind of way. And so to me, it was this energy. It's about energy. When you're an artist, you put energy into your pieces um, that's why we're always taught that when you do this work, you know, do so with, with good energy because yeah, your energy is going to stay with that piece. And I, I like to think that my dad was uh, just sharing a little bit of energy with me that day and uh, encouraging me. So that connection, I know, I, I experienced it, so I know that I want other artists to have that opportunity. For Luann, it's about access, about the importance of community members being able to connect with their belongings. On the one hand, I do like the idea of some of our pieces staying in museums. When I put on my museum hat, though, I look at our policies around access. And this is something that uh, this museum has made a commitment to in its strategic plan around ensuring that access is uh, open and that we have ways to ensure that artists and community members and owners of these pieces always have access. Accessing the museum is something very familiar for Luann. She's been coming to the Royal BC Museum since she was a kid. After her family moved from Alert Bay to the Victoria area, the museum gave her a feeling of home. So the area that we're going into right now is the Jonathan Hunt House. This is on the third floor in the First People's Gallery. Three floors up, <laughs> right in the, in the prime real estate of Victoria, is this big house. This is one of the places I used to visit the most when I was little because this is what we have in Alert Bay. And to me, everything, all of our business that we do takes place in these houses. And it just gave me that connection and then... It just felt like I was at home. It brought me back to Alert Bay. I missed Alert Bay, um, but I also love Victoria. So to me, it was having the best of both worlds. Even on days when I'm here at work and I feel like, okay, the paperwork's getting to be a bit much. I just need a time out. I'll come here. T to me, it feels like we're, we're walking back in time a little bit. It's a cedar-planked house, which uh, has a fire pit in the middle, uh, built exactly the way we would have built it in our, uh, and we still do build them in our home communities. On the one end, uh, which we call the front of the house, is where the singers have a log drum, and then there are four house posts that are carved in the origin stories of the family. So one of the posts, for instance, has an eagle uh, at the top and then a bear at the bottom holding a, another baby bear and uh, another one holding a killer whale uh, with an eagle and a bear. And then there's two of our larger masks that are, are often danced at a potlatch. These are on display here in this space as well. And the whole space is made out of western red cedar, so the, just the aroma of the cedar brings me back home. 
I think it's this feeling of the longevity of our people. I think that's my biggest emotion that I get from here, that we've been here an awfully long time. And no matter what any anthropologist or archaeologist says, our legends, our origin legends, talk about us being here from the beginning of time. So it always makes me feel like I'm grounded, I'm rooted, I'm from here, and there just is no other place on the planet for me but here. There is a complexity to repatriation, to where the belongings are housed. And as for Luan, these are questions for each community to engage with in their own way, because repatriation matters, whatever form it takes. I think repatriation is important for a lot of different reasons. What I've seen and what I've heard people talk about is about the healing. And part of that healing isn't just the knowing that your ancestors are home. It's that things that communities have been saying for a long time has been largely dismissed. And so it's a very validating process. And and it returns things that... The, the culture, it returns the tangible cultural heritage items and the intangibles like the songs, the legends, and the stories. It returns all of those things back to the community to restore the culture that was outlawed for so long. And the culture itself and the arts are themselves healing entities within the community. So, you know, we're not all having to go elsewhere to find our healing. It's right there in our communities and then so close to everyone's hearts. Luann Neal is an artist and repatriation specialist at the Royal BC Museum. She is from the Kwakwakwiak Nation. The Royal BC Museum and the Haida Gwaii Museum recently published the Indigenous Repatriation Handbook. It's available online and you can check our website to learn more at cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Looking at repatriation on Unreserved today. Before Seattle, Washington became the bustling city it is today, it was the home to the Duwamish tribe. But to this day, they are not recognized by the United States government as the original inhabitants of the land. So, a group called the Coalition of Anti-Racist Whites started a campaign to give back to the tribe. Real Rent Duwamish is a program that allows Seattleites to pay a monthly rent to the tribe for living on their land. Patrick Teft is a member of the Coalition, and he joins me from Seattle. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I've never heard of a program like this. How does Real Rent work? So, it works by saying that Those of us who live, work, play, otherwise benefit from being here on traditional Duwamish land recognize that there's an opportunity for local grassroots support. And for those who are able to, in a financial way, to contribute um, support to the Duwamish tribe, they can become part of Real Rent Duwamish and contribute either a monthly or quarterly any kind of regular contribution via realrentduwamish.org. And most importantly, um, that creates a regular, predictable, and sustainable source of income for the tribe with essentially no strings attached. The tribe is able to use the money exactly as they determine. Where did the coalition get the idea for this initiative? It was in large part inspired by something that Cecile Hansen the Duwamish tribal chairperson for uh, almost four decades now, has often said that if every person who lives in Seattle had uh, would donate a dollar per year, then they would be in a much better situation. And then one of the volunteers had a dream and shared it with the group. Then a number of years later, it, it, it took some kind of getting getting going and organized, but with the tribe's blessing and the leadership's approval, then launched its uh, Indigenous People's Day in 2017. Wow, that's amazing. Dreams do come true. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, there's the broader dream still very much of the tribe, and especially for Cecile, who's been in leadership, that at some point that the U.S. federal government will 
re-grant its federal recognition, which was briefly uh, given at the end of the, the Clinton administration and within weeks was revoked by the second Bush administration. Mm. So that is a larger dream. But until that happens and until the federal government chooses to do the right thing, then in the meantime, local residents get to say, well, this is what we're going to do. Do you know what the rent is going towards? So the majority is being used to keep the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center open and vibrant and providing services to the community, serving as basically a spiritual home for the tribe. Thanks to Real Rents, they're able to, with confidence, fully pay staff, keep the lights on. Obviously, it's not the only source of income, but um, it's just been kind of a confidence boost to, to be able to kind of do some necessary things and not worry about kind of living, you know, month to month. Mm-hmm. Do you know how many people are making monthly donations? Yeah, there's just currently, this is cumulative, there are to date just under 2,400 real renters. Wow, that's a great number. Now, as somebody who is non-Indigenous, why was it important for you to to do this and get involved in this way? So I first got involved because I realized that I had been living, working, and benefiting from living on Duwamish land, being in Seattle, obviously the traditional well-known leader, historical leader of the tribe. And I knew virtually nothing about the local history. Mm -hmm. So it was partly my way to get involved and get to know, and then also just to begin to develop some relationships with local leaders. Mm. Do you feel like it's changed you as a person and how you perceive Indigenous people? Uh, Yes, and I think this is something that is kind of a common experience, but it has allowed me to view Indigenous peoples and their place in history as in the present rather than just the past, which I think is the traditional way that I think at least white culture presents and learns about indigenous peoples. It tends to focus on the past. And I'm now fully engaged in, you know, how they are and deserve to be part of the local, the present and the future. What message do you hope that this uh, initiative sends to the rest of Seattle? Well, I think it welcomes more and more people to become aware of, um, in particular, the Duwamish tribe's, unfortunately, not unique situation in that um, they've been fighting for 160 years plus to be granted officially the recognition that was promised to them in the um, Treaty of 1855. I hope more and more local people, you know, obviously build their awareness around that, and then that it welcomes people to be part of a local solution to support Chief Seattle's and the Duwamish people. Thank you so much for your time today, Patrick. You are welcome. Thanks so much for your interest. That was Patrick Teft from the Coalition of Anti-Racist Whites, a group that started the Real Rent Duwamish Initiative, which allows people to pay rent to the Duwamish tribe, the original inhabitants of Seattle, Washington. Jolene Haas is on the receiving end of Real Rent to Wamish. She's a tribal member and works for the tribe's longhouse. She joins me from Seattle. Welcome, Jolene. Hi, thank you. What was your response when you heard about the Real Rent to Wamish initiative? Well, um, I was intrigued and I was also a little confused because I wasn't sure what real rent meant, um, what was the meaning behind it. And then I, I learned more about what the intention was, and it became quite clear to me that this was sort of an act of reparation. So then, you know, the word rent struck a chord with me because everybody in here in Seattle pays really high rent. And, and I and I thought it was a very clever way to get people uh, engaged in in the um, social justice issues around what's happened to the Duwamish and their federal recognition and the lack of um, what's happened with our treaty rights. Do you know how long the initiative has been going on now? So it's been almost a little over two years, and it's been quite a thing. Yeah, it's a really amazing initiative. Do you know how much approximately the Duwamish get? from this initiative? Well, we have over 2,000 regular contributors to real rent, and that fluctuates. And sometimes people give one time, and 
also people give recurring payments. So it goes up and down. I think that, you know, people give $10. Some people give uh, $18.55 to represent the 1855 treaty of the Point Elliott Treaty. And then there's some some bigger donors, but those aren't regular. But anything we get is such a shocking thing to us every month when we receive a check. So it's, it's very humbling experience. Mm, so it varies the amount. Yes, it varies. And what has the tribe been able to do with the money? Well, we've been able to do a lot. We we use the money right away to engage in um, some better advertising um, to get people to visit the Duwamish Longhouse and learn about what we're doing. We're, we're working on some of the deferred maintenance on our building. It's been 10 years since we up- opened. You know, our budget to operate basically just co- covers the basic operation costs. So this has allowed us to do all kinds of great upgrades to our building, which is which was really needed after 10 years. In terms of the um, real rent initiative do do some of your renters come and visit you in the longhouse or yes in fact we have a yearly right around um the launch anniversary we have an open house and a thank you celebration for the real renters and we had one last year that was very successful we had over a hundred real renters come and we provided lunch and wanted to acknowledge them for supporting us and we will continue to do that this year as well. Well, thank you so much for taking some time with me today, Jolene. Thank you for asking these questions that I feel are really important. And Absolutely. I think it's a great thing what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. That was Jolene Haas from the Duwamish Tribe. She works at the Tribe's Longhouse in Seattle. Her tribe has been receiving rent from people in Seattle through the Real Rent Duwamish Initiative. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Earlier this year, it was announced that the National Museum of Scotland will repatriate the remains of two Beothuk people to Canada. The Beothuk were originally from Newfoundland, which is where Mi'kmaq chief Mizel Joe from the Maui Bukek First Nation in Con River would like to see the remains end up. Well, I think they should finally go back to uh, where they were uh, taken from. Uh, How that unfolds, I'm not sure. But my understanding, the federal government made a request to have the remains brought back to Canada. So the first thought would be uh, the National Museum. And then from there, I guess everybody will have to come together and find out and work together to find out where and how those remains will be put back on the land. I don't think it's going to be a burial site. We don't want that to happen, to have them disappear again. And those, those skulls have been gone for since 1828, and it's a long time, and we want them brought back to this, uh, to this country from where they were taken, but we don't want them to put in the ground so they can stolen again. Sharper minds than mine can put together some kind of uh, a monument that will show that those remains are here, and they're protected. Discussions are still in the early stages, so Joe doesn't know where the remains will end up, but he hopes to be included in the decision, along with other Indigenous leaders from Newfoundland. After speaking to the Premier and the other leadership uh, around uh, Aboriginal leadership around Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, we've been told that you know, we don't know. There could be a month, could be two months, could be six months, we don't know. That's the problem. It's kind of hard to um, put together any kind of sense of a ceremony when we don't have a timeline. No, the good thing is we do have um, a letter on file that comes from the museum that they agree to do for the repatriation. You know, that, that's at least some something to hold on. Joe plans to fly to Scotland to help with the transportation of the remains, saying it's important to have Indigenous representation on hand to ensure they are treated properly. But basically, uh, I understand the five uh, different leaders around, uh, Aboriginal leaders around Newfoundland and Labrador will go to Scotland and will do uh, a ceremony in Scotland before they leave. My one concern that I have is that when those remains leave uh, Scotland, that they not be 
put in some kind of a container uh, and ship uh, to Canada. We, we are looking to have something made, particularly for that for that tran- transformation to Canada. Something that shows the symbols of the Beatty people. We want to give them more dignity and respect coming back to Canada than they had when they were taken. That was Chief Mizel Joe from the Maui Bukek First Nation in Con River. He's part of the team of Indigenous leaders in talks to have the remains of two Biathuk people shipped to Newfoundland. To read more about this story, visit our website at cbc.ca slash unreserved. So right across here is the historic original graveyard. Behind us is the Mohawk Council Ganawage building. And right here where that mound is, is where the old Catholic cemetery grounds was used for Mohawk burials from the 18th century to the early 20th century. And that little mound is what remains of the old cemetery. Here would be where the prehistoric remains would go. There's uh, birch trees cedars all along there and it's very peaceful it's perfect to put up prehistoric remains when christine zachary diom was elected as chief to the mohawk council of ganawage her priority was to repatriate ancestral remains seven years later she's still trying to accomplish that goal but for christine it's about rematriation she says the word repatriation is rooted in patriarchy Christine comes from a matrilineal society, and she wants to see the ancestral remains reinterred in Mother Earth. She hopes that when she is successful, the old cemetery will be their final resting place. This is Christine Zachridium, and welcome to Ganawage. Over a long period of time, museums and other institutions, universities, have stored away A lot of our remains, these are collections that have been stored in boxes, on shelves. It's time to reinter these artifacts. It doesn't make sense to us that our people should be on shelves or in exhibits. And quite frankly, it's time to reinter these objects. When I first started thinking about ancestral remains, has to be back in 1974. I was attending then the University of Western Ontario, and I was attending a course on anthropology. I had been shocked by what I saw that was laid out on file cabinets, And that was the skeleton, a female skeleton. It was just lying there, and it happened to have a cigarette hanging out of the uh, skull. And it just seemed so disrespectful. It's not something... I think my people are accustomed to seeing. And it's only now that I begin to realize just how how much disrespect there has been. My God, I'm, I'm just shocked by the way people from other cultures treat Ngwe Hungwe or Indigenous people. And it's amazing to me that There's such a disrespect, and uh, it's almost like there's no reverence for the dead. And I'm always just shocked by that. And I realize that Ngwe Hunwe, Native people, are so much different in the way we treat our dead. We certainly have a big reverence for the dead. And I believe it's because we believe that our spirits are always with us. And I don't see that with the non-Aboriginal people. I don't see that they see their spirits. There is a traditional ceremony, and it will be conducted by the traditional people. That ceremony will be a ceremony of Okiwe. Okiwe is a ceremony for the dead. 
our plan is that the ceremony will be held and then the remains will be placed in the land that has been secured just opposite the Mohawk Council of Ganawage. The plan of the traditional people is to hold the Okiwe ceremony so that the remains are properly interred in the land and so that the prehistoric remains are rematriated and so that the remains are at peace. It will mean that my people are resting. And it gives me a certain feeling of peace to find that they are finally reinterred, rematriated back in Mother Earth and resting. It gives me peace. Christine Zachary Diom is a former chief of the Mohawk Council of Ganawage. Riley Kucherin always had an interest in fashion. He read Vogue magazine and watched all the fashion TV shows, enamored with the images of glamour and beauty. Eventually, he worked in high-end retail and even became a model himself. But while attending grad school at Ryerson, something happened that he calls transformative. Riley, welcome to Unreserved. Ani Bojo, thank you for having me. So what happened at Ryerson four years ago that changed how you saw fashion? Well, I guess I was really embedded in the fashion system. I was kind of dead set on climbing up the retail ladder, making a career out of selling clothes. But at Ryerson, and specifically in grad school, I realized just how damaging the fashion system can be. It's destroying our planet. It exploits workers all over the world. And I realized that one could actually make a career out of critiquing the fashion industry or trying to change the fashion industry. Um, And so that's when it all changed for me. Was there something that happened that that made you see it differently? It was kind of a long buildup. While I was working in retail, I was seeing the mass amounts of products that we were trying to sell, Um, really products that no one needed. We were were marking down products so much so that a a garment we made um, for, say, $50 and we were trying to sell for $200 all of a sudden we're slashing the prices and we're trying to sell it for 150 then 100 and then 50 And so really the value of the clothes didn't reflect the prices and consumers just didn't really need the product. And I was seeing behind the scenes at just how much product there was. So I was realizing just how wasteful the fashion industry was. And I think at the same time, when I entered grad school, I was hired by um, my supervisor, um, Dr. Ben Barry, to help indigenize some of the curriculum at Ryerson. And so that kind of kick-started this journey for me of seeing what indigenous fashion is actually about. And indigenous fashion is so counter what the mainstream fashion industry is about. So it all kind of clicked then. Mm. And when you begin to dive into the research around indigenous clothing and fashion, what did you find? There's these great stories, for example, of of skirts and the length of skirts starting to change immediately upon contact when Christian moralities were introduced um, and skirts started getting longer, um, which was actually so impractical. Say if you're if you're hiking in the woods or, or you're trekking through a swamp, it makes sense to have a shorter skirt. It's just it's logical. But because of those moralities and those values imposed on us, our clothing changed. And then when you get to residential schools, clothing was literally used as a weapon. So clothing could be um, withheld from from students in the school as punishment, for example. But there is also this symbolic stripping. When kids arrived at residential school, their traditional clothing was taken from them. It was literally stripped off them and thrown away or burned. And that was kind of this, this metaphoric stripping of our identities. It's easier to control people when they all look the same. So I think the images are just so striking when all the students are in the same uniform. Um, and you can, you can barely even tell who's who. So that was a very purposeful decision by the state, by the churches, to kind of remove our identity through the removal of our clothing. Mm-hmm. There is a, a moment that you have talked about, uh, I guess a, a follow-up moment. To, uh, it changed your perspective on, on your, all of your research when you are at Ryerson um, Business School. What happened? 
So Ryerson is located right at Young and Dundas in downtown Toronto. Um, and there's often artisans who, who set up shop along the streets, along the sidewalk. And so there's this one Indigenous man who always used to set up his products right outside of Ryerson's business school. So he made moccasins, he did paintings, he, he was always there carving himself, he made drums. And I, in this moment, I saw him doing that outside of the business school. And all of these students who have so much privilege to be in, in higher education, um, learning about how to run a business, how to start a business, how to market themselves. But this man outside of the business school just didn't have access to any of that for really systemic reasons. Like, you know, I don't know what situations he came from, but as a people, we've just not had the same opportunities that non-Indigenous Canadians have had. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's just really striking. Like, why does this man not have the same opportunities? And that's when it kind of hit me that I need to devote my schooling to trying to support Indigenous designers from a management or business angle. How, as entrepreneurs, can we start our own businesses that at the same time bring back our culture through fashion? And that's when I um, got in contact with Angela de Montigny, who's a, a Cree Métis luxury designer, indigenous luxury designer based out of Hamilton. Um, and so I changed my research product to actually be about her. And I, I started working with her for three months to learn about how she balances her indigeneity and all her indigenous values with being a luxury designer and retailer. Mm. How are indigenous clothing and design practices different from the Western fashion industry? From an Indigenous perspective, it's so much based on relationships. Um, So Angela, for example, she knows everyone on that supply chain. She knows where her hides come from. She knows the hunters. She knows the tanners who tan the hides. Um, She knows the beadwork artists. She knows her own seamstresses. Like She has very personal and intimate relationships with everyone who touches her products before they get to consumers. She also has a relationship with her clients. Um, So there's this really great example of she was beading a vest for a client. And she was actually, you know, praying for the client and praying that this vest contributed to whatever that client needed. So she put her spirituality into those garments for those consumers. And you just, you don't get that with the Western fashion industry. Mm, That's beautiful. That's a beautiful ceremony to do. We're talking about uh, repatriation on the show today. How do you hope your PhD work will decolonize clothing and connect Indigenous designers to each other? Well, I think I'm also very interested in kind of the everyday clothing that we wear. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really beautiful that a lot more people are, for example, creating their regalia again or or learning about those processes and the ceremony behind regalia. But I'm also interested in the everyday clothing. T-shirts, for example, are so environmentally destructive. When you buy a T-shirt for $7... You are you're you're exploiting someone, um, probably somewhere around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm really interested in kind of getting us away from this fast fashion, this cheap fashion, and finding out a way or returning to ways that we used to make our clothing. How did we dress ourselves before colonization? Um, I think to some extent we kind of lost that ability to clothe ourselves. Um, so I think decolonizing fashion would would bring that back. Why is this work important to you, Riley? I think we all have something to contribute to decolonization. And I think I had this initial early love of fashion. And I think, you know, every aspect of our society needs to change for decolonization. So if I if I'm in fashion, if I'm at Ryerson, if I'm already kind of embedded in the in these fashion networks here in Toronto, I think that's kind of my responsibility to do this work. Um, I think we talk a lot about um, reconciliation and kind of the economic angle of that. And I think that tends to mean kind of getting Indigenous people involved in resource extraction. And I don't think that's the only way. I think culture can be economic. Um, And if we build our Indigenous creative industries, um, that can lead to kind of our own sovereignty. Riley, thank you so much for your time today. Miigwech. Thank you so much. Riley Kucherin is a member of the Big Tagong Nishnabeg First Nation in Ontario and has earned a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation scholarship to work on his PhD. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. We'll be back in this radio space next week for more community culture and conversation. This episode was produced by Zoe Tennant, Stephanie Cram, Kyle Muzika, and Anna Lazowski. Special thanks to Michael MacArthur, Madeline Green, and Mary Catherine McIntosh this week. If you want to get in touch with us, email us at unreserved at cbc.ca or find us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild, coming at you from Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory. Thanks for listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I go say.
For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.